the next uh, item that we want to do. Now, the thing that I'm going to do with these uh, tools is to make a knurled nut. This, uh, this knurled nut that we'll make is uh, going to be the type that holds the hand, holds the minute hand, on uh, oh, a classic uh, American-made clock of uh, uh, 50, 75 years ago, something like the uh, Ingram or Gilbert or whatnot that has a small uh, knurled nut that uh, holds the uh, uh, minute hand onto its shaft. Most of those clocks have a, a thread that approximates the uh, machine screw thread, which is called 256. That is a size 2 uh, thread. That's the thread that I had confused in the uh, uh, earlier discussion when uh, we were talking about making a screw. We'll make this number 2, and the 56 is 56 threads per inch. We'll make this a knurled nut. We'll make it about a quarter of an inch in diameter on the OD. We'll knurl that, and uh, uh, when we go to place that on the shaft, we'll find that it is ever so slightly uh, in error for a perfect fit on those old uh, American clocks. And in that there is not a nut available, and probably never will be, uh, the thing uh, you do there is to very carefully run a 256 die over the thread that's there. The error in the depth of the nut is uh, less than a quarter turn of the thread. So you can correct that thread to a 256, make the uh, knurl the nut for it, and uh, then you have uh, a uh, uh, good nut to hold the hand on. I'll cut the camera off and I'll make some setup and then be back. We've turned the camera back on and in the period since the the last uh, photograph, I've selected a collet that I would use to uh, uh, make this part. This uh, collet is uh, number 65, uh, yes, 65, and uh, I have sawed a piece of uh, uh, stock from a hard bronze rod, quarter inch in diameter, and uh, oh, it's about approximately a half inch uh, long. We look at it here, it's really 418 thousandths of an inch long. I'm going to use that to make the, uh, uh, this knurled nut. Now, we come to the point, and I mentioned in, uh, I believe it was in tape, uh, Clock Talks number two tape, that uh, never throw away your scrap. This uh, is a completely adequate piece of raw material to mount in this collet and uh, to make that uh, uh, knurled nut. So we're using, I really didn't saw this off. I said I sawed it off. I really picked it out of the scrap box, but it's uh, appropriate in size and right for what we're doing. Let's place that in the, in the lathe and uh, flip up the uh, tool rest. Now, let me uh, give you a thought of the process that uh, I'll be using. I have an overhang uh, here of this this collet, overhang of the stock of uh, 228 thousandths of an inch. That's a scant quarter of an inch this, that we have uh, in overhang. I have the burr and the fact that the end is not square. Now I'll, the first thing I'll do is to square up this end and deburr it, then I will swap ends with it in the collet and go to the bottom of the collet. I'm talking about uh, uh, lathe and lathe, lathe collets, I believe in, in uh, Clock Talks number one. I mentioned that uh, the larger collets do not have a through bore. Uh, this particular, uh, the depth of this collet is uh, 230 thousandths of an inch. The spindle does not permit that larger size uh, to pass through its central area. I want to be able to seat against the bottom of that pocket and I want to be square against it as that helps me in taking the piece out, returning it, and coming back to the uh, uh, proper uh, place. So the first thing we'll do, I have touched one end of this a bit with a file so it enters uh, uh, relatively easy. I will uh, uh, deburr this and uh, uh, we'll see what we have get the safety glasses and I loop on and uh, I want to run this, a run the lathe a little faster 
and I was running it uh, uh, in the previous uh, work. So we moved down one step on the pulley. Uh, we reached back here and, and tightened the belt, and um, we're ready to go. The speed that this lathe is running at this particular point is, uh, let me look at the ratios and I can estimate this. Uh, we're probably running about 13 or 1400 RPM at uh, uh, this point. I get that from the ratio of the pulley from motor to uh, uh, counter shaft and then from counter shaft ratio up to this, about 13 or 1400 RPM. I use a tool that is uh, not, not one that I have just sharpened, but one that is fairly sharp, and I'll do this first time I work here. Let's do that. I'll try to keep my hand out of the monitor area. I've chamfered the end of it on the uh, broken edge on this, and squared this off. What I have is, is a square end, uh, possibly you can see this, it's uh, uh, very bright where the machine cut is. You see the light reflection on it there, it's very bright, and that's square. So I go deep, seat it in the uh, collet, ring it in place, tighten it up. We'll run dead true. There's a little wobble, uh, a little run out out here on the, on the end of this. If you want to look at the magnitude of the run out, touch it with something up close and watch the end of the, the pencil see what we have here. I'll square that up now. See what we have. Maybe I'll take my cap off. Being uh being bald headed, here it is about uh, winter time. I usually wear a cap just for the sake of serving body warmth, but uh, we'll take that, that cap off to get it out of the line of view. I'm approximately right. Let me look close. No, not quite there. Not quite. explain uh, uh, what we did in this cut. I squared this surface off across the end, perfectly true, and uh, a bright, clean cut. I broke the edge here probably about uh, five thousandths of an inch at about 45 degrees. This is running uh, dead true. Now the next thing I want to do is to drill this center, prepare my hole, that I'm going to uh, run the tap through. Now let's look and, and see how we find that. I believe it was in uh, Tape Talk 2 that uh, we looked at some measuring instruments and I looked at a, a, a drill gauge here. The thing I'm looking for on this uh, uh, gauge, if I can get this back, maybe where the reflections are not too great, I'm going to look right up here at the top and it says, uh, tap size 256. That's that's the thread size that we will use. That is a number two. Remember that the number two is two times 13 plus 60, uh, which is 86 thousandths of an inch, is the diameter of the thread uh, on a screw. That says the hole has to be smaller than uh, 86 thousandths of an inch. All right? It says 256. That's 56 uh, threads per inch. And uh, here it says drill number 50 is the tap drill. That's the appropriate drill, appropriate size for tap. Body drill, that drills a hole that the number two screw would pass through. That's a drill number 44. All right, let's look in our drill index and uh, uh, pick the uh, number 50 drill. Here's the uh, a drill index. Let's see if I can get this in the uh, light of the camera. 
We pull back. This has about uh, uh, 60 bits in it. As a matter of fact, it has exactly uh, uh, 60 uh, bits in it. And we're looking to be sure that we don't make an error. Tap drill is number 50. All right. We go back uh, another uh, deck in this. And uh, here is, um, no, that's too far. Uh, no, it's not. Here's number 50 right here. This drill right here is number 50. By keeping these in the index, it tells us that that uh, drill is a number 50. It's 70 thousandths of an inch in diameter. When we thread that hole, it's going to open up and the threads will be such that the number two thread, which we determined earlier, was 86 thousandths of an inch, will pass into that hole. All right, with this drill, and we'll drill this by hand with a pin vise. Uh, let's find a, an appropriate uh, uh, chuck in the uh, uh, pin vise. If I were uh, working in uh, uh, a lathe with a chuck holding uh, tailstock in it, I would simply uh, uh, put this in the uh, lathe chuck, in the tailstock chuck. Here we'll place the, the bit in uh, uh, a pin vise. Screw this up. Now I have to start the bit. I start the uh, the hole. I want that hole to be perfectly true. I don't want it to go through at an angle. When I thread it, I want it to be uh, uh, true, so that uh, it uh, will screw down uh, firmly against the, the hand. So I must catch a center to start my drill. Let's do that. Use fine pointed graver. I 
I want to continue on until I am uh, approximately two nut thicknesses deep. And uh, as we continue the work, there will be, uh, I'll, I'll discuss the uh, uh, reasoning for that. Let me touch another drop of oil in there. This is a valve spout oil. I close the tip on the oil every each time I use it to keep it from weeping on the table. Now I'm going to turn the oil off. As the hole becomes deeper, it's uh, more difficult to get the chips out of it, and particularly to get them out unbroken. Then I slip the bit in the in the. Um, um, pin bias again. It takes considerable pressure to drill this, um, uh, well, I'm not doing very well there. It takes considerable pressure to uh, uh, drill this bronze. It's not because the, the bit is not sharp. It's because it is just tough stuff to, uh, uh, to drill. And uh, if you were, if you had your hand on the graver in the turning operation, you would find very vividly very, very vividly that uh, uh, this is anything but a free machining material. Probably drilling this hole is the most uh, uh, most difficult thing that there is to do in, in making the, the nut. Let's see what we have. We've got uh, approximately, uh, to get that measurement on the end of my finger, I thought I had. Let's turn off and try again. We'll turn it around this way. Set my thumb against it. We have about a quarter of an inch of uh, depth. We've got about a quarter of an inch of hole there. So let's call that uh, uh, sufficient. we we'll look over here in the, in the uh, tools. Find us a countersink, and we break the edge of that uh, hole that's in there. We're going to have this as the outside of the nut. Let's strike a couple of decorative rings on it. We'll restart. I'll touch the hole break to be sure that the, the countersink didn't chatter and, and uh, uh, leave a, a rough spot. And I'm going to turn just a couple of circular rings uh, in the face of this nut, we'll call this the outside of it, purely as a decorative item because it would look rather bland to be that size and uh, uh, without any form of decoration on it. It's right in the eye view in the, uh, uh, and it will be used in the clock. Let's turn the tool uh, rest around. Move it around about like this. Now the next thing I'm going to do is to cut a series of V-shaped grooves along a distance of about uh, approximately uh, an eighth of an inch on the outside of this nut. Now the purpose of these V-shaped grooves, they will be like threads. They will be like threads except it's not one continuous uh, uh, a spiral. It'll be three individual uh, grooves, three individual grooves. And when we go to knurl this, what we'll do, we'll cut the knurl crosswise uh, across these uh, grooves, and uh, that gives it um, uh, a series of, of tiny, tiny points in the circles around the, uh, uh, the nut. All right, let's uh, find a tool bit here that has about a 60 degree angle uh, on the end of it that we can cut those grooves with and uh, it looks like one of these that I didn't sharpen is the and it feels pretty good looks like the one that we didn't sharpen is the, the one that uh, is, has about that angle so let's do that we'll cut the three grooves these grooves about uh, 50 or so thousandths of an inch deep. We'll bring the crest of them 
to a point. And uh, we're just about, just about there. will become the, the depth of the nut. The next thing I'm looking for is to cut this off. If you recall in the uh, earlier tape, I said that the ground rule for making a part is to always make the part with a handle on it and let the last operation be to remove the handle. That's what we're going to do here. We're fixing to cut the handle off. The, the left piece is the handle. I'm going to machine a groove around this that um, uh, I can run the hacksaw into and uh, cut it off. So let's turn the groove around for the cutoff location today. Let's um, let's look at one of these. Uh, cuttings. Possibly you can see that cutting. It's uh, hanging right here that come off. I told you repeatedly that this hard bronze is not free machining, but with a very sharp tool at the proper angle, it does cut uh, reasonably well. Most clockmakers will be working with uh, watchmakers' lathes that are not uh, uh, too well equipped. If I were doing this uh, ordinarily as a, a job in the shop, I would cut this off with the uh, uh, tool slide rest with which I could uh, impart more pressure and with a very thin uh, cut-off tool. I'm not quite deep enough yet. Uh, working in. Considerable amount of sawing to get this off. This, uh, as we saw uh, earlier with the uh, uh, eighth inch stop, and incidentally this is the same material that uh, I was using uh, earlier today. Uh, each, uh, each, each rod is a piece of uh, commercial brazing rod, hard bronze. Uh, this one having a uh, basic diameter of a quarter of an inch, the other one having the basic diameter of uh, uh, one-eighth of an inch. The cost of a three-foot stick of quarter-inch brazing rod is about $2.25 in uh, 1987 prices. And uh, we get uh, when these quarter-inch rods and make a lot of nuts. Now, let's find something to hold this. back to the uh, tool department and uh, took out a brooch. And let's slip this on the brooch. I would get where we can see it now. Right here. We do not have the knurl. The knurl is not on it at this point. We do have the decorative rings out in the uh, uh, front end of it. And the decorative rings. The back end of it is tapered back and rough cut. The next step is to machine that cut. All right? Got a little problem here. We may not be able to get this out of the chuck. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Oft times we have to, uh, and we save this little piece also. Uh, we oft times have to run uh, 
a rod through the headstock to knock out a short piece that is cut right down to the surface. Let's reinsert this uh, in this chuck. I need to look at it uh, uh, carefully to see the, the depth. Approximately straight, we can see the wobble right here, just, just a mite. I need this a little bit further out. I'll lock my index here and <clears throat> pull this uh, uh, further out right there. See how we are. We're pretty much straight. Look at the brooch. We're on the taper and the brooch. We're pretty much uh, uh, straight in. Now, the next operation will be to uh, uh, face the end of that nut. The end that we are facing will be the end that goes toward the hands. It needs to be rather large. It needs to be uh, uh, flat. That's an easy machine operation. We'll do that in just a few moments. against the hand in the knurled area. That gives you a little more finger uh, position area to uh, tighten it up. I like to make the surface of that nut ever so slightly concave so that it holds down near the outer portion of the hand hub rather than just in the uh, uh, center portion. That's a, a technique of uh, um, just finesse in, in uh, doing the job. I want to chamfer the entrance way to uh, Take the, uh, take the tap that we'll be using. We had the nut blanked out and uh, on uh, a brooch, a brooch is slipped in the nut so that we can uh, handle it without dropping it. We'll take this back into the lathe and uh, lock up the lathe index, tighten this in place and get the uh, uh, axis approximately centered. The next step will be to thread the nut. Here we have a tap handle about uh, or approximately four inches long and this is about uh, uh, one quarter inch across the jaw. We will use this tap handle for the 256 tap that uh, we will thread this nut with. Deep in this jaw is a second set of jaws that we can hold the uh, 256 tap. We remember that two is a machine screw size number two, 56 threads to the inch. The um, uh, diameter of the thread, the major diameter of the thread, is 86 thousandths of an inch, and we uh, uh, drill the hole with a number 50 drill, which is the appropriate drill size for this tap. We center this into the uh, lathe by eye, looking at it on this axis and this axis, and then we begin turning and uh, threading. We'll find that uh, uh, threading becomes very easy with no danger of breaking the tap, provided the hole is uh, uh, appropriately sized. This nut is made from hard bronze and uh, as such does not really tap easy. But as we pretty much pass through the nut, we can rotate the, the uh, uh, work by pulling the belt, not under, under power. Should we find a bit of bind in this, then we should rock back and forth to uh, break the chip, and we come out like this. Now the thing that we find is that that tap is sharp, and uh, the hole is sized properly, that we should be able to screw that tap back in place uh, 
with our fingers. Now let's remove this, remove the work from the, uh, the lathe. We find the nut now can be uh, screwed directly onto, uh, uh, on the tap. That finishes the tapping operation. Let's uh, see if we can see this in the, in the camera. Uh, the nut has uh, a couple of decorative rings turned in the uh, face of it here. We turned a series of, of uh, uh, V-shaped grooves here. The crest of each of these uh, uh, turnings is sharp. There's uh, three there. And the thing that, that remains is to knurl we want to knurl the outer surface of this nut uh, such that we can uh, uh, place it on and off of the uh, uh, center shaft of the clock uh, by hand. This is large enough that we can handle it in our fingers. If this nut were smaller, it, uh, it would be uh, proper to handle it on a brooch. Just slip this onto a brooch uh, very lightly, not enough to damage the thread, but it's a holder, and uh, you recall that we use that type of holder to take the part uh, in and out of the uh, lathe collet. Let's uh, make another setup, and uh, we'll do the knurling job. Now let's discuss uh, the knurl situation. We'll lay aside the pack of brooches, the brooch that we were using. We will take the uh, uh, knurled uh, nut to be knurled, Let's screw that back on to the uh, uh, tap. And we'll use the tap then as a handle uh, to hold uh, this nut while we perform the knurl operation. Knurling uh, in a commercial form is done with uh, a group of rollers, usually three, in a nutcracker-like holder in which the uh, a device to be knurled is rolled within the uh, nutcracker roller or uh, as a tool post knurl that is a knurling wheel that uh, is held in the tool post of a lathe and this is done under great pressure but for our purpose here and the workman that uh, casually makes a, a knurled nut recall that we have turned a series of grooves that have a sharp crest here. It's like threads, except the, it is not a, a spiral of threads. It's a series of rings. We will lay this on a, a large, coarse mill file. Lay this on the mill file. We take a, a second large, coarse file. We lay on top of this, and with considerable pressure, we roll the nut. Now, the tap is used as a guide. The tap is used as a guide and a handle uh, to prevent this nut from falling over. And uh, it will roll on the threads in, in the tap. Now as we have uh, uh, done this, we find that we have a very nice knurl here. The texture of the knurl corresponds to the uh, file teeth. It's best if the file teeth be uh, uh, quite coarse and uh, quite sharp. These files are many years old and, and uh, quite well worn. But uh, the texture of the file will um, uh, determine what the knurl uh, looks like. Now we have a very good, a very nice uh, hand nut and uh, this completes the operation of making this nut. You will find that uh, you only need the very simplest tools to do this. We need the tap of the appropriate size, of course, a couple of, uh, a couple of files. And uh, you may even find that uh, if you use one file and roll this against a hardwood block, the single file uh, will also do quite well in uh, uh, knurling the uh, uh, nut. But this is uh, one of the tricks that we can uh, uh, perform. On the watchmaker's lathe, it's very easy to do this with uh, uh, handheld tools. That is, the handheld graver, uh, the drill, the drill bit, uh, in a pin vise, and we come out with an excellent uh, result. Let's talk about suspension springs and pendulums for a little bit. This uh, particular pendulum here is from a Sessions kitchen clock of 
all 50 or so years ago. And uh, the suspension spring that I have in my hand is one of the commercial uh, type, has a, a little dimple or a hole stamped here uh, to latch it into the chops in the top of the clock. Uh, it has a, uh, a clamp that holds the lower end of the spring. The spring is, is fairly stiff. It's probably in the order of about five thousandths of an inch thick. When we form the hook, one of the things that's important is to form the hook so that the central portion of the pendulum eye is in a vertical line with the rod. You'll notice that this, this hook is not a sweeping turn hook, but it comes down, turns back, and then around. That says that the pendulum hangs centrally here with the rod. It should be formed that, uh, that way to prevent the crutch, as the crutch straddles the rod, from causing a cranking motion or a turning motion of the rod. Uh, that uh, results in a serious error problem in being able to uh, regulate the movement. Now let's look at another situation. Hang this uh, on the, the uh, suspension spring. I'll hold it with a long nose plier here. And let's watch the oscillation. You notice the jitter in the upper rod. This is a secondary oscillation of the pendulum, and if that occurs, that destroys the resonant frequency of the primary rate for timekeeping. Notice as this swings, see the see the tremor in the in the upper rod. This this tremor right here. Let's look at it. It may go away. It may not. It may continue continuously. It may be aggravated by full wound mainspring. And if there is any detection whatsoever of that tremor, such as if I shake this right now, if we have any detection of that, we will have trouble ever bringing the clock to a reasonably good rate. So it's important that the hinge area of the suspension spring to the pendulum ball be such that that is not prevalent in the uh, uh, swinging of the pendulum. There are some techniques that can be used to uh, uh, reduce that tendency. You can go in here with a little uh, round file and taper the edges of this of the uh, eye on the two sides. You can form the the hook with a very sharp with a very sharp bend so that as the hook hooks into the eye of the pendulum, the two pieces lock together, and we'll have to suppress that. This is an important factor in uh, uh, fitting up a new suspension spring and rod so that we have none of this action uh, in, the, in the operation. The second thing is, is the wobble. It's commonly reported that uh, a pendulum wobbles because a suspension spring is, uh, is bent or has some, uh, a crease in it, and that has some credibility, but not the real cause. Note the tremor in, in this at this point. This pendulum, with this length rod, and that hookup would be a notoriously poor timekeeper without that being corrected. Let's look at uh, uh, oscillation in the rotary mode. Let's look at this. You see the oscillation there. This looks like that uh, the rate is changing direction four or five times a second, something in that order. If that mode of oscillation is harmonically related to this mode of oscillation, we can never stop the wobble of the pendulum, pure and simple. That's the way it is. So what do we do about this? 
in the situation with the heavier pendulum bobs and the lighter, thinner suspension springs augments that particular problem. The thing to do is to look at the swinging rate and look at the rotary rate. These are diversely different. This being a slow rate, this being a faster rate. We must separate those two rates so that they're not harmonically related and that they will not occur if we are to get the best timekeeping. Now notice here, I've caught the suspension spring up shorter. Now let's look at the rotary rate. Notice that it is much faster. And if I catch up shorter again, it becomes faster again and is damped out quicker. We have this flexure here. That is a separate problem from this rotary rate. Now, when we replace the suspension spring, it's important that if we have that wobble, first, if we have this rod in a plumb line, the hook forms such that this rod is in a plumb line through the pendulum so that the force of the crutch does not impart a cranking action to the suspension rod. The second thing is to see that this oscillatory rate here is not harmonically related to the primary rate. And how do we do that? Simply by changing the length of the suspension spring. Many of us make suspension springs from bulk stock, such as this. This is a piece of uh, uh, stainless steel shim stock, such as available in uh, automotive parts houses. It's cut about a quarter of an inch wide in uh, a sheet metal shear, or if you're careful, you can cut it out with a good strong pair of, uh, of uh, scissors and uh, be sure and cut this lengthwise with the grain. This piece here is thicker than this one. Notice, notice the rate of oscillation. Notice the rate of oscillation. Let's pull the two together. We see that the, the rate is different. The thicker spring is a faster rate. It behooves us in the interest of conservation of power to use the thinner spring. But we must be careful that this rotary rate, the torsional characteristic of the spring, does not put the wobble into the pendulum. So in, in that consideration, it says that we need to adjust the length of the spring. I usually cut these about this long, if we look at that, that's about four inches long. So I use the stop, shear these out, and make two springs from this. And I begin with the spring about this long. If I don't have any uh, particular problem with it, we let the situation go. If I do, then I shorten the spring. Usually you will find that shortening the spring is the solution to that uh, uh, rotary wobble. Now, the real question when we make the suspension spring, we find that this attachment here is not a type of attachment that we can uh, readily produce in our uh, repair shop. We also find that uh, if this has a dimple stamped here to latch into the shop, into the, into the chops, this one has a hole, uh, we can't very readily duplicate that dimple without uh, damaging the end of the spring. This spring appears to have had a dimple and then later a hole pierced. So let's see how that we will uh, uh, cope with that situation. First we'll uh, have to uh, get some tools in order and then see what we can do with that. Let's look at uh, a method of placing a hole 
and a suspension spring. This is the suspension spring that uh, we looked at a few minutes ago. And uh, let's, let's take this piece of blue steel spring here and pierce that. This is a little knit staking set, which is the most inexpensive piece that can be bought. It comes with about a half a dozen punches and a few stumps. Uh, this uh, 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 stake here is primarily made for small watches. It uh, says J.G. Hall on the bottom of it. I'm persuaded that that uh, uh, device is probably as old as I am, namely 66. And uh, this is a Kendrick and, and Drake uh, Inverto uh, tool and the box of punches and uh, stumps. Let's uh, use this little job as a, as a beginner in the first, first look. We have a punch that has the hole size that we're expecting to use. We select a stop from the set and uh, place that in the, uh, uh, in the tool stand and we center up the um, uh, punch and the stump. Now it is as simple as laying the spring in it, centered, and let's see if we can get into focus a little better here. See the, the, the spring, the punch, the stump, and a stroke with a brass hammer. Use a little brass hammer, be kind to your punches. And that's all there is to it. Here we have uh, uh, the spring. Let's see if we can find a, a better spot of uh, uh, focus here. We have the spring and the hole. We've tried adjusting the focus of the camera a little. Possibly we can see this a little uh, better now. Here's the hole that uh, we have pierced in this. It's uh, a very easy situation to do. Uh, if we used this little staking device to move our punch over, set up and center the, the hole, and we'll try again. We have the piece ready to make the the, uh, the hole, and here we have it. We now have two holes in the end of the spring. If we should uh, try to use this staking set, let's give that a try. Locate the proper hole in the die plate. Take a look again as to what we're uh, after, and we have the third hole. Now, as we look at this, we find that uh, really piercing a suspension spring is a very easy situation. If we begin, as we make up the suspension spring, say about two inches long, and uh, we find that uh, the rotary rate of the pendulum is such that we get wobble. We shorten it from the top. Shorten from the top. It's uh, prudent to make the hook, the first hook, on your suspension rod with maybe an inch turned up on the end so that if you need to adjust it, that you haven't cut it too short. So. Uh, as we bring the clock to rate, we can trim off the, the excess there. Now, how about the other end? The other end of the spring needs a larger hole if we're going to pass uh, uh, a suspension uh, wire through it. And here is a piece considerably stiffer than uh, we saw before. This is about uh, uh, 10 thousandths or 12 thousandths of an inch thick. 
and it's had larger holes uh, pierced in it by the same technique. This is not suitable for a suspension spring. It's, it's too stiff. It's uh, suitable for something else. But you see that the staking set uh, is the tool to make the holes. Now, if we find that this raises up a burr, there's a considerable burr there, that burr can be diminished by the hole being a closer fit, the hole in the die plate being a closer fit uh, to the punch. We should select the uh, uh, punch and hole in the die plate so that the punch only just enters the mouth of the hole in the die plate. That will give the cleanest cut. However, this is not a particular problem. Uh, it, it needs to be uh, corrected. We take a bench block, and for this we need to use a hardened, uh, uh, hardened steel bench block. This is a steric uh, uh, bench block. Uh, this particular uh, block here, a V-block for a drill press, this is a hardened one. This is suitable. Uh, this particular block here is uh, a soft block. That is, it's steel, it's harder than brass, but uh, it is not suitable for uh, vigorous use as an anvil. So let's see what we do with this. The best thing to do is to, is to strike this with a brass punch. Probably a reasonable thing to do is to strike it with a punch that has a spherical face and strike it from the burr side. And that can be done like, like this. Now this takes away uh, the burr. Didn't quite get it there. I believe I'm feeling of the adjacent uh, burr. But we can take the burr away. Don't run your clock broaches in one of those these to be buried. Don't run a good file in it because this suspension steel the blue steel is as hard as the brooch, as hard as the file, and the steel will damage uh, either of the tools. Knock the burr off, knock the burr off with a punch. An alternative is to do this. Let's take a punch set. This is a uh, steric toolmaker's punch set, but let's say we take the largest punch there, make this easy. We go on to a hard block and flush the burr down. And the burr is totally gone at uh, this point. That's the burr of the first hole. That hole needs to be of uh, such size that uh, a small piece of wire can be passed through it uh, for suspension purposes. What do you call a small piece of wire? Well, it happens that uh, laying here on the, on the bench, this piece of a paper staple that uh, a little piece of paper staple it looks like this is a second hand one that's been removed from something but that piece of staple would make a suitable little piece of wire to clip through there and form so that it uh, uh, can't escape now if we form this if we form this the larger hole and the lower end to go on a rod like this. Now I've misplaced the piece of rod that I've cut away, but let's assume that we have this cut off here, and we want to latch into a hole approximately like this one. This hole right here. thing to do is to file away half of the section of this so that when we look into the end, as we look into the end of the rod, directly into the end, we see a V-shape. And file that with a square corner upon the, the rod. Form this V back through the hole 
on the spring and then seat it with a hammer. It would look like this with the uh, inner side being flat and we would seat it down uh, such as that. It's prudent to hold this in a little vise or a strong tool so when we strike it that it does not roll over. If it rolls over when we strike it, then we would damage the spring that we have just uh, just made. But in so doing, we can use commercial springs, rods, and we may need to adjust the, the uh, uh, length of these. It's entirely possible that we need to adjust the, the uh, length of it. We can use the stainless steel springs or the blue springs. We find that all of these will work uh, uh, reasonably well and interchangeable with each other. But as we assemble the pendulum rod and the pendulum, be sure that it does not oscillate this way. Be sure that it does not do this on the tip of the rod and be sure that it is tight in the chops and that this rod is plumb from the suspension point down through the pendulum. 